So that is five prime end dependent initiation. But as I've told you, viruses do things differently. And that leads to the next discussion of other mechanisms for decoding that have been discovered in virus infected cells. And one of them is called ribosome shunting. So again, these are mechanisms that were discovered by studying virus infected cells, but which probably exist in uninfected cells. In this case, it hasn't been discovered yet, I'm quite sure. So ribosome shunting is a mechanism of translation whereby uh, ribosomes bind to the 5' end via the cap structure, as we've just described, they, and they scan a bit, that is, they move towards the AUG, but then at some point they leap over the secondary structures and, and reach the AUG without going through them. So this is a, an experimental uh, evidence for ribosome shunting. What's been done here is to make uh, three different messenger RNAs and each of them has a protein that's going to be translated, which can be assayed readily, and the protein is shown on the right in this Western blot. It's called S-antigen. This is actually a hepatitis B viral protein. So if you take the wild-type mRNA at the top and translate it uh, in vitro, you get uh, two proteins. Main is shown here. If you put a stable stem loop structure here uh, just before the AUG codon, and translate that in vitro, it's called the three prime insertion. You see that it does not have any effect on the amount of protein that's made. And this is a very stable stem loop of negative 80 kilocalories per mole. It's a measure of the stability of the base pairing, which is known to block scanning of ribosomes. Even with the ribosome associated helicase, it cannot get through this kind of secondary structure. Yet you see that the insertion of this has no effect. If you put the same stem loop structure, however, upstream of the secondary structure in this mRNA, then you can see its presence blocks translation. Now, this green RNA is a sequence from a viral mRNA, in particular an adenovirus mRNA, and it's known to have these secondary structures in it. And what this RNA does is confer uh, what's called ribosome shunting, so that if you put the secondary structure near the AUG, apparently the ribosomes can go right over it. And if you put the secondary structure upstream of this, uh, the existing viral mRNA secondary structures, it impedes translation. So how does this work? Well, what we think happens is that the ribosomes bind the 5' prime cap, and they begin to scan, and they have to probably reach the first secondary structures, and then they're, they're handed over the rest of the secondary structure to the AUG. And so that's why having this secondary structure, the red one, at the very beginning blocks translation, but at the end it does not. Let's take a look at that in another figure here. So here we have the mRNA 5' prime UTR with all the secondary structure. This is the wild type sequence. The ribosomes have bound the cap and they're scanning. They reach the first secondary structure, and from that point on they can be passed over the structure to the AUG codon. So the ribosome is not scanning through and melting each of these. Rather, it's being passed over in some way to the AUG. And this is one depiction of how that might work. And this must be a very highly structured RNA and that, can, that the ribosome can just pass over to reach the AUG. And this ribosome shunting has been found in the mRNAs of a number of different viruses, as you can see here and hasn't yet been discovered, to my knowledge, in cellular mRNAs. could be wrong there, but I'm sure it will be. And this, so you would ask, why do we do shunting at all? It's predicted to decrease the dependence of any particular mRNA for the cap-binding protein complex, EIF4E and EIF4G, uh, during initiation. So this uh, mRNA doesn't have to be unwound because the ribosomes are passing over the secondary structure. So in cases where cap binding proteins are limiting, which can happen at certain parts of the cell cycle, for example, or during virus infection, then this shunting would allow efficient translation in the absence of cap binding protein. The other mechanism that was discovered in virus infected cells is internal initiation. And this was first found in the 1980s in the genome of poliovirus. And when the genome of polio was sequenced, what was found was a very long 5' untranslated region, which is shown at the top here, a single-stranded RNA sequence. You can see it's 742 bases long. Uh, and then 
here is the initiating AUG and the, the beginning of the viral polyprotein. If you remember, poliovirus has a plus strand RNA genome, and it encodes a very long polyprotein that is translated and then processed by viral proteases to give rise to the final viral proteins. The initiation of that polyprotein translation begins right here at this AUG. Now, this was puzzling, this long 5' prime UTR, for two reasons. First of all, because it had a lot of AUG codons in it. And it, it wasn't understood how a ribosome could bind to the 5' prime end and scan through all of those and reach this first initiation codon without falling off. The other problem, of course, was that this, pro this viral RNA didn't have a cap at its 5' prime end. Rather, it had a protein. And indeed, this protein is, is removed when viral messenger RNAs are, are translated. The protein is put there as a primer during RNA synthesis, but then is believed to be removed from messenger RNA. So the viral RNAs that are translated don't have a cap. They have just a 5' prime phosphate uh, at the 5' prime end of the RNA. So at the time, the dogma was ribosomes bind cap at the 5' prime end. They scan to the first AUG. So this, this viral RNA violated that idea. So how, how did this work? So the idea arose that perhaps the ribosomes can bind internally. Maybe they don't scan. So an experiment was done to address that possibility. And in this experiment, two different mRNAs were constructed. They, all, they are both capped mRNAs with poly-A tails at the 3' prime end, and they encode two proteins. Here you can see the proteins are called TK and CAT, and these are simply two proteins that can be assayed using antibodies. Now, this is an old experiment. You can tell by the use of these reporter molecules because if this experiment were done today, you would use luciferases, which can be readily assayed without running a gel. When you translate this mRNA on the left, now I should tell you that the mRNA, in addition to the two reporter molecules, has a sequence in between the two. On the left, it's a random sequence, and on the right, it's the 5' prime untranslated region from poliovirus. Now, if you take the control sequence on the left and translate it in cells, you get a lot of the first protein, the TK protein. As ribosomes bind to the cap and they scan to the AUG, they translate, and then most of them fall off the mRNA at the termination codon. A small fraction continue to scan and reach the second open reading frame, so you get a little bit of cat protein made, but not very much. If you translate the construct on the right, now you find you get a good amount of both proteins made, both the upstream and the downstream protein. And the idea is that this sequence from the poliovirus genome, the I, which now is called the iris, allows for internal binding of ribosomes and translation of the second open reading frame. Now, in eukaryotic cells in general, when you have two open reading frames like this on a single mRNA, the second one is rarely translated very well. But this shows that this sequence from poliovirus allows internal initiation so that you can get efficient translation of a second open reading frame. So this was called an iris for internal ribal excuse me, this was called an iris for internal ribosome entry site. And it's since been used uh, for many experimental applications where you want to make two proteins from a single mRNA. Now, the skeptics at the time said, well, how do you know actually that the ribosomes are binding internally? It could simply be that this sequence allows ribosome transit more efficiently than your control sequence. So to address that, uh, the experiment on the bottom was done, which, in which the same two mRNAs were taken and translated in cells infected with poliovirus. Now, as you will see later, poliovirus inhibits cap-dependent translation. So this mRNA on the left, when put into a poliovirus-infected cell, results in no protein synthesis. This is because the ribosomes cannot bind the 5' prime end, so therefore they cannot translate either open reading frame. If you put the second mRNA into poliovirus-infected cells, you only find the production of the second open reading frame because the ribosomes are able to bind internally to the iris and translate the cat gene. 
And again, the TK gene is not translated because the ribosomes cannot bind the cap because of the polio-infected alteration, which we'll talk about a bit later. So this uh, established that this sequence from the polio genome could lead to internal ribosome entry. But as always, there were still skeptics. Uh, and the next experiment to address them uh, dealt with the idea that an iris does not need a free 5' prime RNA end to attract ribosomes. You can see in this depiction the ribosomes are binding internally, whereas 5' prime end dependent Translation needs a 5' prime end, as the name suggests. So uh, the way to test that hypothesis was to make circular mRNAs. So two mRNAs were produced, one with an iris and one without. Both have an open reading frame whose translation would lead to a protein that could be detected. Now, if you have a circular RNA without an iris and you put this in a translation extract, you make no protein. Ribosomes cannot bind to this screen sequence because there's no iris and there's no free five prime end with a cap, so it doesn't get translated. If you put the circular RNA with the iris into a translation extract, you make protein because again, the ribosomes can bind internally to the iris. There's no need for a free five prime end. These are what irises look like in general. They're highly structured. Uh, these are four different kinds of iris. We, we call them various types now. And the types are based on various properties of the iris. In addition, their their secondary structures. As you can see, there's a lot of RNA secondary structure in the form of stem loops, uh, which varies from iris to iris. On the upper left is the type 1 iris, which is the poliovirus and rhinovirus, or enterovirus iris. Uh, and you can see it's highly structured. Uh, the AUG is right here at 743. And the way this works is that the ribosome binds uh, to this structured RNA and then scans to the AUG. Here's on the next one is the type 2 iris, which is found in other picornaviruses. You can see also extensively structured but different. And here, this oval is what we call the EIF4G footprint. Remember, EIF4G is that large linker protein that helps nucleate the ribosomes onto the 5' prime end of mRNAs. And we believe that the 4G binds right to the iris, and that's how it recruits ribosomes. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. On the upper right is the iris of hepatitis C virus, uh, and at the bottom is the iris of a, an insect picornavirus, cricket paralysis virus. Now, you can't identify an iris by a sequence. There is no canonical iris sequence. It's the structure of these RNA elements that is important, and we cannot identify an iris by its structure by just scanning sequences. So you have to do an experiment. If you have a very long 5' prime non-coding region on your mRNA and you think it might be an iris, you have to make a bisistronic construct to prove that. And what I mean by that is you have to make an mRNA with two open reading frames, two reporter molecules, with your sequence in between them and see if you can get translation of the downstream um, open reading frame. The hepatitis C virus deserves special mention because it is an RNA element that can bind the 40S subunit in, without any other initiation proteins. And uh, the, the EIF4E is another of the initiation proteins that does bind the iris as well, and it's needed to have the 60S subunit come in. But 40S alone will bind uh, the iris of hepatitis C virus. So again, this, this really emphasizes that this iris is very good at attracting initiation complexes. How do these irises work? All right, let's compare them to cap-dependent initiation. Here on the top is the structure of the initiation complex that we discussed, an mRNA which is recruiting the 40S subunit via uh, the interactions with the cap structure. And all the eukaryotic initiation factors are needed to translate such mRNAs. We think that for the type 1 and type 2 irises, it is actually EIF4G that binds the iris directly, and I mentioned this briefly already. And of course, once you have 4G binding, you can get the 40S subunit in by those protein-protein interactions that we talked about before. 
So these kinds of viruses require all the eukaryotic initiation factors, but not EIF4E, which is the one that contains 4G and 4E. The, the significance of this broken end terminus will be apparent in a bit. And then we have the hep C iris, where the 4DS subunit binds uh, directly to the RNA, and the only initiation proteins you need are EIF2 and uh, EIF3. We've since found irises in many viral genomes, and this is a selection of them here. You can see the picornas, the flaviviruses, pestiviruses, and retroviruses, and insect picorna-like viruses have irises, as well as uh, cellular mRNAs. These have been found to contain irises as well. Now, these cellular mRNAs, like many of the viral mRNAs uh, that have irises, are capped. So it's not clear why these would have an iris in them and also have a cap. In other words, caps allow you to be translated in a cap-dependent manner, or 5 prime n dependent manner, I should say. But the cellular iris bypasses the need for a cap, so it's not clear why cellular mRNAs need both. One idea is that uh, in under conditions where cellular translation is inhibited, like when... Uh, mitosis occurs, for example. Cellular cap-dependent translation is inhibited. Maybe for certain proteins to be made, they need to be synthesized by an iris-dependent mechanism. So that could explain why certain kinds of um, cellular protein-containing mRNAs need to have irises. Mm -hmm.